Hello everyone, my name's Daniel, and I'm back to say farewell to October 9th. It is now passed in all time zones, and it is clear that something in my interpretation of scripture and the signs in the sun, moon, and stars is and has been incorrect. So, let's do a recap of, you know, where things went wrong. Uh... And where do we go from here? So, since May 4th of this year, I have been thoroughly convinced that Scripture, from Scripture, that the fall of Babylon would occur on the last great day of tabernacles. And that's based on Joel 2, 15-16. And when I saw the signs in the stars, I was thoroughly convinced that this has got to be the day. What are the odds that these, these signs would be here on the day? I put a lot of effort into proving the calendar, proving the day, proving uh, the year of the cross, proving the Jordan River crossing. Like I go as deep as I possibly can on each of these things uh, and try to verify them from as many objective sources as possible. So uh, when the day came and went and I have something wrong, it's like you have a whole page of math and you missed the sign somewhere and you got to go figure it out. Maybe we literally missed the sign. But for the past five months, I have been warning everyone about the coming fall of Babylon and the rationale for it. Now, I still think it's coming. There are five signs that point to 2024, uh, being the last year of the 70 Jubilees, being three and a half years before the desolation of the abomination, uh, you know, the fig tree generation, seven years from the cross in 31 AD. There's a lot of things pointing to this year. So, you know, I think we are in the ballpark and we've got to um, just look at what we might have gotten wrong. So, is, uh, is the year wrong? Is the calendar wrong? Is the feast day wrong? Does it have to fall on a feast day? And how do you, how is there this sign? And is the sign just imagination? Can you imagine a sign on any day? Um, and so there's just a lot of things to go through. But let's evaluate some of the fruit of the past five months. As watchmen, it is our job to look for anything suspicious and then warn others. And so if you see someone drop a suspicious package in a public place, you warn people to investigate even if you're not 100% certain that it is a threat. The majority of the time, it is a false alarm, but sometimes it saves countless lives. So uh, everyone who likes to say I'm busy deceiving people, I, if so, I've deceived myself, but my goal is to seek the truth and, and interpret it and show the justification and show the evidence for how I reach my conclusion. So a lot of people see the video, but they don't see the 70 videos of evidence and deep research that led to the conclusion. Uh, so, you know, go and show me which facts I got wrong. You know, review my translations of Daniel 12 and Daniel 9 and show me where I made a mistake. Um, because that's where the, the facts are and the facts are what need to be uh, investigated. So, because of Revelation the Stars, there are now countless people that are aware that 2024 could be the year. Even if October 9th was the wrong day of the year, just being aware of fall uh, 2024 is a huge wake-up call for people, and it doesn't take much looking at the news to see any day now, perhaps the next two days, uh, Iran, Russia, and China could respond with nuclear war, uh, especially given the attack on Iran today. So, People are awake, they're paying attention to the feast days, they're learning <clears throat> to walk as they walked when they came out of Egypt. Uh, even Nelson Walters, who recently reviewed my video, uh, he was able to extract new and useful insights from the work that's been done. So even if the whole thing is not, the, you know, the ultimate conclusion might be wrong, there's lots of bits and pieces that built up to it that are still useful for the community to review, to be familiar with, because they might be parts of the puzzle that point to the final conclusion.
<clears throat> so even my parents and many other people have been saved. They've rededicated their life. So there's been lots of positive fruit. And I've seen lots of people posting the, in the comments. And I encourage you to post in the comments in this video of all the positive fruit of uh, sharing Revelation with the stars, the discussions, the anticipation, uh, and all the things that have come out of it that has been good, even if the date was wrong. Uh, so I'm going to use a, a quick moment to address some of the allegations uh, for people that think that I put this out here to make a lot of money on YouTube. Uh, you know, they, they think that there's a profit motive, that I'm just trying to sensationalize things to make money, but I can assure you that is not the case because I do my best to seek the truth and share what I find. And if I am mistaken, it is not intentional. And Yeshua's blood covers us for all of our unintentional sins and mistakes. So I'm not trying to deceive anyone to make a dollar or to make money off of prophecy because we're not supposed to make money out of what he reveals to us. We're supposed to freely give what we have received. So I'm just going to be completely transparent about my YouTube channel for a moment. So here's a brief sample of the views and the promotion costs on YouTube, as well as revenue uh, that I've received from YouTube. So for some reason, YouTube gave me three cents in estimated revenue because there was a brief period of time where the video was forced to be monetized because of a uh, incorrect copyright claim. They were taking the revenue and giving it to the copyright holder. Once that got resolved, they credited me with three cents. Um, but here you go. You can see that estimated revenue. I made no money off of Revelation in the Stars. And here you can see that I spent uh, about $110,000 on YouTube promotions just to promote uh, the pre-release and the final video to get more video views. Uh, I did some other promotions of some of my other videos as well, but this is just the Revelation the Stars video. Uh, and other people made allegations while I was trying to sell books. So here is the stats from Book Baby that demonstrated that total book sales $7,000 in revenue, but almost all of that is from one person who bought a thousand copies and did not use the October 9 code that would have made me have zero royalties. Uh, and I don't know who that person is. Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, so that's the total amount in sales revenue from the book. You can also see that my other book, uh, I made $78 in the same time frame. So you can look at, well, maybe I'm making money for promoting my entire channel. I've only monetized one or two videos, old videos that don't haven't gotten very many views, in an effort to minimize you know, the number of ads people see. So I had to sign up for monetization so that I could decline monetization intentionally on my other videos. It was a technique that some people recommended. So as you can see, over the past month, I made seventy dollars, uh, and this is channel wide for my entire channel. So I'm not monetizing my YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, I've already addressed my book sales here. So um, this combined with production costs of the video, which are about $40,000, billboards that I put in various places. I've had ads on Spotify and Pandora that pointed to October9th.com, which then pointed to the video. Uh, and of course, my Day of Atonement. Um, Ad. All told, I spent about $1 million um, promoting and raising awareness of 2024, potential fall of Babylon, uh, and of course, if my plan was to make money off of the video, I failed miserably, and I'm pretty sure my accountant is not going to allow me to claim these costs as <clears throat> business expenses, so I don't even get a tax write-off. So, there you have it. I am just trying to share the information that I have gained uh, for you know the benefit of all who who uh, can learn from what I have learned and and help point me in the right direction and share information with me. So learn and share. All right, back to the um, recent 
review of my video by Nelson Walters. It's so great that he finally took the time to watch my video and comment on it. I've been wanting him to watch and comment on my findings for the past five months. Uh, it's a shame he didn't risk anything by commenting before October 9th. Uh, but nevertheless, he finally did, and it was good to see him uh, raise this awareness. Um, so I'm going to address some of the things he said in, in this particular video. Uh, and the main thing is that we agree on the seven-year period. He just thinks the Jubilee is at the end in 2031 and not at the beginning in 2024. And uh, I think there's some major problems with his conclusion, so I'm going to just review the evidence that he has not addressed um, when it comes to this. Uh, so my claim is that the uh, first year, the first Jubilee of the 70 was 1406 BC. And his claim is that it's 1399 BC. It has to be exactly seven years later to be on the same Shemitah cycle um, and, uh, and line up. So that's the, the difference in our opinion on this particular thing. But there are consequences. If we move the Jubilee to when he says, then all of a sudden Ezekiel 40 no longer falls on a Jubilee because it would have to be seven years later. And then Josiah having the, the, the word, the Torah, restored, would no longer fall on a jubilee. It would fall seven years before a jubilee. And that is two dates. Now, nothing says that jo Josiah had to get the word restored to them on a jubilee, but the fact that it was restored on a jubilee makes a lot of sense typo uh, typology-wise. But Ezekiel 40, with uh, defining Rosh Hashanah right here, in the 5 and 20th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, that phrase is Rosh Hashanah, which is Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, in the 10th day of the month. So it's saying the 10th day of the month was the head of the year, uh, in the 14th year after the city of Jerusalem was smitten, uh, and that's when he had his vision. So this is Rosh Hashanah occurring on that year. We know exactly when that was. And so uh, we know, um, I guess the years aren't, yeah, I got the years here. Um, so we know that that was a Jubilee year, and that only works if it's 1406 is the Jubilee cycle and not what Nelson Walters is claiming. Um, so there's another inconsistency that if his interpretation were correct, uh, yeah, I already covered that. So let's go into, you know, what does the scripture actually say here about the Jubilee year? Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruits. So it's when they come into the land. They came into the land when they crossed the Jordan River, not six years later when uh, Joshua divided the land among the 12 tribes. So Nelson didn't particularly mention the verse. He just mentioned the, the situation. They had six years of war. And then the land was given to them. So, so Joshua took the whole land, which so they already had it, and they've been gra gradually, gradually increasing it, according to all that the Lord said unto Moses and Joshua, and gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from war. So the land rested, that's a reference to the seventh year. There's six years of war, I've proven that in the past. So six years of war followed by the seventh year of rest. According to Nelson, that is the Jubilee. But this would shift the Shemitah cycle because they would have had to have the, the, the Jubilee year is the next year, not the seventh year, but the, the first of the next seven years would be the Jubilee year when they get their inheritance. Uh, so this isn't lining up. Um, so... Leviticus says, when you come into the land, which occurred at the Jordan crossing, is aligned with when they started eating of the land. 
So for six years, Israel as a whole ate of the land, and then they rested on the seventh year. So it was only divided among the tribes in the last year. So let's look at Joshua 5.12. It says, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old grain, King James calls it corn, the old grain of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Eating of the fruit means you possess the land, you're getting the benefits of the produce of the land. And that's immediately after Passover, right after they crossed the Jordan before taking down Jericho. They're already eating of the fruit of the land. So by Nelson's account, Israel would have received their inheritance in the seventh year. And that does not align with the same Jubilee cycle or the same Shemitah cycle. We have another witness in the book of Jubilees, which states that the 50th of the 120 Jubilees defined in Genesis ended when they crossed the Jordan, which started the final 70 Jubilees. And this is, And after this law I made known to, uh, to thee these days of the Sabbaths in the desert of Sinai, which is between Elam and Sinai, and I told you all the Sabbaths of the land on Mount Sinai. So he's talking about all the Sabbath weeks and jubilees and everything else. Uh, and the land shall keep a Sabbath when they dwell upon it. All right, so he told them all that stuff while they were wandering. Wherefore I have ordained for thee uh, the year, uh, weeks and the years and the jubilees. There were 49 jubilees from the days of Adam until this day. So when they're given the law. And one week and two years, so another nine years. So 49 jubilees plus nine years. And there are yet 40 years to come until learning the commandments from uh, of the Lord in the desert. So they're going to wander and they're going to learn. And until they pass over into the land of Canaan, crossing the Jordan to the west. And the jubilee shall pass by until Israel is cleansed from their guilt. So... I guess they're cleansed from their guilt on a day of atonement. That will be relevant later. Now, I don't believe Jubilees is scripture, but Jubilees does provide a strong historical account of when they considered the beginning and end of the Jubilee cycles, and they considered crossing the Jordan at the beginning of a cycle, not seven years later. Um, so for all those reasons, I believe that Nelson Walters is wrong I've got multiple witnesses to his one uh, interpretation. So, uh, the next thing to address is the desolation of the abomination. So we both appear to agree that it'll be desolated around Passover 2028, even if we have different calendars. And I, interestingly enough, we both have signs in the stars from Revelation 12 on our interpretation of the timing of the abomination or of desolation or the desolation's abomination uh, that confirm our understanding. But he places Passover on the full moon and I put it on the dark moon, a difference of about two weeks. So how can we both have signs, both tying it to the same scripture, uh, and yeah, but we agree on the year? Uh, so this is why I consider signs in the stars to be kind of troublesome. It's possible to rationalize many signs and not even realize you are doing it. We each identify different red dragons. So Nelson has his red dragon. I've got my red dragon. Uh, you know, mine is thrown into the sea, which is a group of sea-related constellations. Uh, and his is carried by a man. Uh, um, I can't pronounce the name of the constellation. I'm not going to try right now. Uh, my sign is predicted by Stellarium. And I did a whole video about the sign of the abomination of, the desolation of the abomination at Passover. And his is speculative about the effects of a potential meteor that could explode in the, st in the sky. So he doesn't even actually have evidence of a sign, but he's claiming a sign will be there. So by definition, his sign is going to appear on his calendar, whereas my sign appears according to what Stellarium says will happen. One of those is a useful warning. The other is, well, you know, it's like seeing a road sign just as it passes you. It did you no good to, to uh, make your exit. 
Uh, so it's for this reason that I rely on Scripture first to establish dates, and signs in the stars are just circumstantial evidence. Uh, they're interesting. They tell the whole story. If you know that's the sign, then it, it works out. And if it's not, then it's like trying to interpret clouds. Uh, different people will see different things out of the same cloud. So, uh, is Nelson did appear to appreciate the connection between Psalm 90 verse 10 and Israel flying away on eagle's wings, but uh, he completely missed that the last 10 or the strength had labor, travail, and sorrow before that happened. So that's the pre-tribulation rapture, Nelson's post-tribulation. That's a whole other uh, set of scriptures I'm not going to get into right now. Sadly, uh, Nelson brushed off the other prophecies pointing to 2024, including my interpretation of Daniel 9 and the two orders to rebuild Jerusalem, uh, as well as my interpretation of Daniel 12, where I show that the sacrifices were taken away past tense. I would really love for him to review uh, Daniel 9 confirms the pre-tribulation rapture and the exact timing of 70 weeks revealed. I think he might only have two days to do so, but nevertheless, uh, it would be awesome. If you haven't seen this particular video to understand where my translations come from, check it out. My translations are not just pulled out of nothing, but they're strongly supported by Blue Letter Bible, Strong's Concordance, and what the plain best I can figure of the understanding of the Hebrew language. Uh, I haven't found anyone really done a deep dive critique of my word by word, letter by letter translation. I would love to have uh, that type of feedback. So if the year is right, then either the feast day being the Atzeret or the calendar, sliver or full moon. One of those two things must be wrong. Uh, in my understanding about the fall of Babylon. Uh, so the Atzeret on October 9th was the last feast day of the year on the calendar that I believe scripture supports, leaving only minor anniversaries such as the timeline of the flood and man-decreed feasts such as Hanukkah and Purim uh, for things to fall in the near future. However, the, the the connection with the phrase last day to the day he will raise us up, right? He'll raise us up on the last day. And all the other connections to Aseret, uh come to me, I'll give you living water and all those other things, is just so strong. Um, I, I, I almost see that as stronger than my calendar. Uh, so I'm looking at the sliver moon calendar as the next best guess as you know maybe he's going to do things on the babylonian calendar or the jewish calendar so people can recognize them maybe there's something i'm missing there but i'm going to have my eyes open on all of the remaining feasts on the traditional uh well the sighted sliver moon calendar there are not the dark calendar that official Jews and the state of Israel recognize the dark moon. Uh, so let's review um, the original fall of Babylon for a second, because I think that timeline is, you know, going to rhyme approximately. Uh, the um, fall of Babylon was on October Sorry. If we assume the sliver moon, then the Atzeret will be October 27th, about two weeks from now. So if, if I was right about everything but the start of the month, October 27th would be the next day to look at. Uh, and if you assume that uh, I was right about the moon, but it... Um, I started the year at the wrong time, which a lot of full moon people believe I did, then November 7th. So those are two dates that fall in 2024 that if I got the start of the year wrong or the 
start of the month wrong, but I got the feast day right based on Joel 2, 15 through 16, then those are dates that we will want to look at. Now, when we look at Cyrus, he entered Babylon on October 29th, 539 BC. Of course, the Babylonian army was uh, destroyed and uh, towns started to just give up and not, not fight him. Uh, so around October 9th, 10th of 539 BC, that's when everyone just started surrendering and basically it was over. Cyrus is going to march right into Babylon and he took Babylon, uh, the city of Babylon, on October 29th. So it took time from that date for the army to reach the capital. All right. Uh, so I think that it's fascinating that October 27th and 29th, it's all about the same time on the Gregorian calendar. Uh, if Babylon follows a similar pattern, that would be very interesting. I apologize for being a little bit all over here, but I was trying to get a video out for you all about uh, getting the date wrong. So at the end of Nelson's review of my video, he recommended this other video about his signs in the stars from Revelation. I decided to check it out because, hey, you've got signs in the stars. Let's see what he considers a reasonable sign. Uh, and, you know, one of the issues many people have with my signs is that they didn't fall on their feast days, right? October 9th was not official feast day. But all of his, he says, do. Um, that said, Nelson claims the signs should appear on biblical feast days and then immediately references the Revelation 12 sign from 2017, which didn't occur on a biblical feast day, even on the, the dark moon or the silver moon calendars. To give him credit, he did acknowledge that, but then he rationalized why the day after the feast day makes sense. So he just admits it doesn't have to be on the feast day. The day after is good enough. Uh, but once again, to get that outcome, he had to rationalize the definition of the sign with the moon being at the knees instead of at her feet on the 22nd of the month instead of the 23rd of the month when most people put the sign. Um, so by my uh, understanding the sign either occurred on the second to the fourth day of the seventh month using the dark or sliver moon calendars, uh, depending on how you count sighting the moon. Whereas on the full moon calendar, it occurred in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. So right off the bat, he's being inconsistent on whether or not signs in the stars have to appear on uh, appointed times or not. So he also stated that signs are something that people need to see, and that a sign that people cannot see is not a reasonable sign. But by that very logic, the dark moon, which he uses as the sign of the start of the month, is ruled out. It is a sign that cannot be seen. Uh, and for people, and for most people, the sliver is a sign that cannot be seen because they either lack a clear view of the sky, they're, you know, they're in a valley, uh, or they have poor vision, or there's clouds. There's just a lot of reasons why you can miss the sliver moon as a sign you can see. But the dark moon is definitely never a sign that you can see, uh, except maybe on uh, solar eclipses. So the Jews' own history documents that they switched from a, a sliver moon to a dark moon. That's undisputed. So the modern calendar is not historically what they did, and they know it. So therefore, Nelson is being inconsistent with his application and expectation of signs. If the second to fourth day of the seventh month is uh, a good one for a sign, for birth pains in Revelation 12, why not the seventh day of the seventh month? Two sevens have got to mean something uh, on October 9th. So his second sign is an exploiting asteroid in Serpens. Uh, is speculation only, and it falls on a feast day by definition that it's speculative that it's going to happen. Uh, because by this definition, uh, you know, he would, there's going to be Passover at the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, and of course, he's got a new Revelation 12 sign that appears at the end, but without Jupiter in the belly of the Virgin to indicate that the child is born 
Um, so then that would, of course, be uh, according to his Dark Moon calendar. Now, if you haven't seen this video, this is my Passover 2028, the dragon being thrown down into the sea uh, with seven stars on its head, a crown of seven, seven crowns on its head, seven stars. Uh, Saturn and Mars go off to make war against the remaining of the seed while the woman is carried on eagle's wings. Um, this is the sign that I see that Stellarium reports compared to his speculative exploding asteroid. So, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think my sign is more legitimate than his speculative sign, so I don't know how he can be so uh, dismissive of the October 9th sign. Other than the fact that October 9th has passed, and we got a biblical earth um, hurricane, uh, one of the strongest on record. I think it's the second strongest on record. Uh, and a massive CME directly at the time that I was expecting the, uh, the rapture to occur, uh, sunrise in Israel. So we got some very interesting events uh, on that day, but not what I was expecting, and I'm not going to claim that those events uh, fulfill the prophecy in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, the next thing people are wondering is, am I going to set a new date? Because they always say that people immediately set a new date. Um, and I warned heavily on October 9th uh, because of the abundance of signs and scripture and everything else. Um, but at this point, I do not have enough information to fully establish a new theory that I can fully get behind. Um, but all the news shows any day now, uh, and I'm going to be watching all the feast days on all the calendars uh, just in case, uh, but I can't tell you that I have logical, consistent ways of resolving all the information I have right now, because that's the way I work, is I identify facts, I make sure I eliminate logical contradictions, and when I've eliminated every contradiction I can find, then I assume I've arrived at an approximation of the truth. Uh, right now there are a lot of contradictions that I have not yet resolved, given that October 9th has passed, uh, and so now I've got to go and uh, figure that out. But I do want to point out some interesting observations on October 14th, which I think uh, would be the next date that I would watch closely. Um, so, on October 14th, the moon is in conjunction with Saturn, which as we learned in Revelation of the Stars, uh, is symbolically connected to Babylon, meaning 666. It's under the Bowl of Wrath, in retrograde, uh, and in many places from Earth, the moon will actually cover Saturn for about four hours if you're in South Africa or India. You'll be able to see that. And depending on the calendar you follow, if you use the first visible crescent as being October 4th, <coughs> uh, the evening of October 4th was, was seen, then the 14th of October is the Day of Atonement. So we could have a situation where the Day of Atonement on a jubilee year, uh, where our sins are forgiven, our debts are wiped clean, falls on the same day that Saturn is hidden, never to be seen again, so to speak, uh, and is poured under the bowl of wrath with the moon pointing uh, out at the star. Right? The moon typically acts as a cursor uh, as far as what constellation uh, to look for because it's the fastest moving. It's like the second hand on the clock. It moves the fastest. Compared to all the different planets, they move at different speeds. So having the moon be there on that particular day with everything else uh, points to October 14th being uh, a day to watch, and there's it's a significant day, Day of Atonement, on a significant year, the year we proclaim the Jubilee, if the first visible crescent is indeed the true start of the month. I, I'm still having a hard time supporting, seeing the supporting evidence for that. Nevertheless, since I was wrong about October 9th, I am considering October 14th as the next 
most interesting date with circumstantial signs in the sun, moon, and stars, whose interpretation, of course, is subjective and uh, not defined by the Bible. So, uh, just something to watch for. And I have many people that follow this liver that are actually doing Day of Atonement right now on the evening of the 12th to the 13th. Uh, so, for depending on which sliver you choose, uh, then you're going to get different Days of Atonement. And of course, uh, Mr. Rude, uh, Rude Awakening, they observed it on October 4th. So according to them, this is all going to occur on the Day of Atonement. So, who knows? Maybe that is the day. And, uh, you know, given that Israel just attacked Iran's nuclear facilities with a cyber attack, uh, give them one, maybe one day to figure out their response, and then the next day they execute it, it is very likely that we could have the response of Iran, Russia, and China coming in the next two days to line up with the fall of Babylon with the moon uh, in Aquarius on that particular day. Uh, so stay alert, uh, and you know, most importantly, always uh, seek Yah with all your heart, mind, and soul. Seek to keep his commandments, even the smallest of the commandments, out of love, not to earn your salvation, but as a result of your salvation. Uh, and you know, do your best and pray that he forgive us for our ignorance, for all the mistakes that we make, because uh, there is just, you know, without, without his free gift, without his salvation, uh, we would just have no hope. Uh, so please forgive me for my mistakes and, uh, you know, help me continue to pursue the truth. Let me have all the feedback you can give in the comments, and I'll see you around if I don't see you up there. Good night, everyone.